Let's talk about some basic definitions of evolution. The word evolution literally just means change. For example, a child evolves into an adult. But in biology, and regarding the origin of the species, it has two very distinctly different meanings. First, there is microevolution, which simply means change within an existing species. Examples would involve things like different hair color, skin color, eye color, any, any of which could actually help a species adapt to changing circumstances. In fact, it, it's an amazing ability to, to help species survive. Uh, it's basically what it is, is change within an existing DNA code that exists within the species. And Darwin actually used this to talk about survival of the fittest. And in fact, even biology test textbooks will often talk about microevolution. But the key is the DNA structure already exists. It just allows variations within that cell structure. It has nothing to do with a frog turning into a hamster or a, an ape turning into a human being. The second area is called macroevolution. Now this is the theory of one reproducing species randomly changing into another totally different reproducing species. An example here might be a fish turning into a lizard and again an ape to a man. But this theory would indicate that humans' original ancestors really came from just a single cell that was able to subdivide into two cells and eventually was able to turn through a great parade of changes into a human being. In this series, we're going to use the word evolution to talk about macroevolution because that's the way it's generally used in the world. Let's take a quick look at the history of this debate between creation and evolution. It might shed some light on why people think the way they do today. Most people don't realize that it wasn't until the mid-1800s that most of the world's greatest scientists accepted the Bible as absolute fact. Now this includes Sir Isaac Newton, perhaps the world's greatest physicist. His physical laws were even used later to try to disprove parts of the Bible. But yet, Newton was still one of the world's greatest supporters of Genesis and of the Bible. Perhaps he realized that he didn't have a microscopic view, or he didn't have a view of the heavenly realm. And it's this information that has caused great revelations that, that help us understand that the Bible is true. But it wasn't only Newton, there were many, many other great scientists who be firmly believed and supported the Bible. The list is enormous. People like Kepler, Galileo, people like uh, Pasteur, what, the father of modern medicine, and the list goes on and on. So what caused this rift between science and theologians? Well, in the mid-1800s, two things happened that started to create some problems. Number one, of course, was the, the original book Darwin wrote called Origin of the Species. Uh, the second one, the second thing that happened about the same time was a new concept or idea called the higher criticism of the Bible that really scrutinized in a different way the Bible's reliability. Now, Darwin's theory lacked a lot of things at the time. They had, there were very few fossils available and it certainly lacked modern scientific knowledge, knowledge we have today. Higher criticism of the Bible was without modern archeology. span Archeology span was very young then. As a result, biblical scholars lost a very highly publicized debate. This is the famous Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925. This debate placed famous orator William Jennings Bryan representing the Bible against a very skilled defense attorney, Clarence Darrow. Now using a very clever argument, Darrow forced Bryan to conclude that Genesis may be wrong his logic used in his argument, we know today to be completely wrong. One of the key arguments was that science believed at that time 
that the universe was infinite. The debate had far-reaching impact. Christians were regarded as prejudiced, uninformed, and ignorant. And the, this whole emphasis on infinite time, thought correct by scientists then, created two fierce battles. Battle number one, Christians versus science. Christians started to believe that they needed to agree on a, quote, time of creation. This created another problem, battle number two, Christians versus Christians. Since scientific evidence seems to point to an earth created millions of years ago, one group of Christians started analyzing the Bible and believes that the earth was created only about 10,000 years ago. It's called the young earth view. The other group of Christians believe that the earth is millions of years old. Now both of these views are consistent with the original Hebrew of the Bible as we'll be discussing in a minute. Unfortunately, this issue of time of creation arose only because science had so little understanding of the universe in 1925. Today, we know the universe had a beginning, just as Genesis 1 states. And we'll show later that even 15 billion years, which sounds like a lot to us, is not nearly enough time to randomly produce even a single living cell. Stephen Hawking, one of the most brilliant scientists since Einstein, teaches one of the most accepted theories of the origin of the universe. In his book, A Brief History of Time, he describes how he thinks the universe evolved. In a fraction of a second, he says, unknown quantum physics developed subatomic particles known as quarks and antiquarks. In another fraction of a second, these particles formed protons and neutrons, the basis, of course, for atoms. The protons and neutrons binded together to form common elements like hydrogen, all in about one second. Within about three minutes, all matter and radiation were coupled together. Then, over 300,000 years, electrons bind with nuclei and the universe becomes transparent to the cosmic background radiation. The next 1,000 million years create stars and galaxies and quasars. When these are present, solar systems form that create living matter. To start with, <clears throat> let's take the age of the universe. Now, I'm not going to argue about a young Earth, old Earth viewpoint. Let's take the most conservative viewpoint from a number sense. Let's assume that the universe might be in the neighborhood of 13, 15 billion years old, which would be at the outside edge of what most scientists believe. Uh, and in fact, the latest uh, space technology actually confirms that that is the probable, at least from a scientific viewpoint, probable age of the universe. Now this equates to about 10 to the 17th power seconds. That means basically 10 with 17 zeros. Now, secondly, let's consider the amount of matter in the universe. Matter are particles, things, substance, if you will. Uh, the smallest particle, if it, we all know that matter is made up of molecules, molecules by atoms, and atoms by subparticles. Well, if we were to say a baryon, which would be like a proton, uh, would be the smallest particle of matter in the universe, let's, scientists have calculated, again, through a lot of our recent technology, a maximum of about 10 to the 84th power number of baryons, or uh, tiny little particles that would exist in the universe. Um, then let's consider the number of conceivable interactions of these particles with each other. 
what we're driving at here is what is the chance of these things randomly coming together over time to, to form something so complex as a reproductive cell? Well, scientists believe that the maximum number of interactions between these subatomic particles would be 10 to the 20th power. In other words, 10 with 20 zeros, essentially, per second. That's 10 to the 20th power interactions per second. Finally, let's take the number of events required to randomly produce a living cell. And again, we're getting back to some of the great research done by Harold Morowitz. Uh, biochemists have calculated this to be 10 to the 100 billionth power of, of interactions. That's how many interactions would be necessary to create a, the very first simplest living cell. Let me repeat that number. It's such a vast number, again, that some computers have a hard time even dealing with this number. It's 10 to the 100th billionth power. That's a huge, huge number. Okay, so let's see what this means in mathematical and probabilistic terms. What we're looking at first is the maximum possible number of, of atomic particle interactions that could have occurred. If you take the total amount of time, we talked about that, 10 to the 17th, times the total amount of particles in the universe maximum, 10 to the 84th, times the maximum number of events per second, 10 to the 20th power, that equals a total possible number of interactions in the universe since the beginning of time of 10 to the 121st power. So you can look at the probability of evolution by taking the total possible number of interactions and dividing that by the number of interactions necessary to realistically create the first reprodu reproductive cell. So if you take 10 to the 121st power and you divide it by 10 to the 100 billionth power, that equals basically 1 over a huge, huge number. Any mathematician would look at that number and say, well, that number is simple. That number is zero. So mathematically and probabilistically, you can v literally prove, literally verify, there was just not enough time, not enough matter, not enough space for, for even the very first living cell to have ever occurred on Earth. Uh, and this is something that, that has staggering implications. That's why when science learned that, that time and space had a beginning, it doesn't matter if you're a young Earth viewpoint person and looking at a 10,000-year-old Earth. It doesn't matter if you're looking at 15 billion years. And I could show you the same mathematics. It doesn't matter if it's 30 or 100 billion years. No matter what number you choose within, within any reason at all, there is just not enough time, matter, in space and interactions to possibly conceivably put this structure together to begin with. Let me tell you two stories about my watch here. Now, Nothing really fancy about this watch, but uh, as you'll be able to see, it's a combination analog and digital watch. And the first story is this. The first story deals with how this watch was created. Now, there was a project uh, director from Japan. His name was Nomo. And he started several years ago with a team of, of engineers that created detailed engineering drawings for every little component in this watch. Calculations obviously had to be made to size 
all of the different gears that created the analog mechanism to calibrate the uh, timing mechanisms and to create the integrated circuits for the part of the digital display. But in the end, what did they have? Well, really what they had was just an attractive ornament. It wasn't really a, a timepiece yet. Uh, and in fact, it didn't serve any purpose until, until somebody wound the watch up. Then it became a timepiece. Now I'm going to tell you story number two about how this watch evolved. You see, billions of years ago, the Earth was really much more uh, favorable to manufacturing than it is today. There was kind of a part, there was a sea of ooze that surrounded the Earth. And the sea of ooze just happened to have all the right little elements in it that were needed for this watch. It had little teeny pieces of, of metal, and it had little teeny pieces of the silica that, that, made, uh, that would eventually make the crystal, and little bitty pieces of paint that were all floating around in this ooze. And there was volcanic heat at the time, and over a process of a real long period of time, this volcanic heat made these particles of metal bond together. And as they continued to tumble in this ooze over billions and billions of years, a few of these pieces of metal started to form these highly precision gears. And it was very fortunate that they just happened to be exactly the right size necessary to create a timepiece. And you had really quite kind of an incredibly beautiful uh, little ornament. Uh, it just lacked a, one problem. It, it still needed somebody to wind it. Now, which of those two stories do you believe? The idea of evolution of a watch seems absurd, at least I would hope so. A single living cell is so vastly more intricate than this simple little timepiece. So much more complex than a simple watch. It's beyond comprehension. Just think about a few things. Watches don't reproduce. They don't diagnose themselves or heal themselves. They don't think, they don't create. The list goes on and on and on. So why do we, why do we laugh at some story of a evolved watch and teach evolution of a far more complex living cell? Do you know this, the human cell is far more complex than the most advanced manufacturing facility in the world? Now in Darwin's time, uh, Darwin and other scientists such as David Hume regarded cells as just blobs of protoplasm. They really didn't understand how they work. Today we can look inside these cells. We know how incredibly complex these cells are. If you take a single cell, this, its size would be much, much smaller than the period at the end of a sentence in a typical book. Yet, this single cell, so tiny, is far more complex than the most modern factory in terms of the functions that it performs. Put another way, so vast is the information routinely managed by only one human body that scientists have calculated what it would be if it were written in books, in tightly spaced books. And what they calculated was the number of books it would take to cover that amount of information of one human body routinely managed would fill the entire Grand Canyon. But that's not the end of the story. It would not only fill the Grand Canyon, it would fill it 50 times over. Just the information routinely managed in one human being. Evolution assumes a change of, of many complicated events over billions and billions of years. Events that require very highly complex changes. Just the steps of development of DNA alone. This is a very insurmountable problem for evolution. To keep it simple, all the DNA and RNA required of all life is a highly complex chain of events. Now the chain of events in and of itself is, 
is very, very complex, but if you take that chain, just the development of that chain, you would find that it's statistically impossible without input from an intelligent designer. Another huge problem is that the amino acids that bond with nucleotides hundreds at a time in a chain, yet the entire chain of each must have the same orientation of that amino acid. It's called either being right-handed or left-handed. Now this sounds very complex and I'm not going to get into all the details, but let me give you a simple, a very simple analogy. What would it take to randomly produce one single DNA molecule? First, DNA defines the traits and characteristics of humans. Let's assume that a computer randomly typed letters on a page until it perfectly spelled out characteristics of a human being. That alone would probably take forever. In other words, just random letters being typed until you get a perfect description of a human being on a page. Let's just assume each word on the page had to be spelled correctly with perfect punctuation. That makes it harder to conceive because now we're looking at, at not only perfect information, but it had to be spelled perfectly and it had to be perfectly punctuated all by a random computer. Now let's take the simplest aspect of what would have to happen in this building of a DNA chain. Let's assume that this random computer had a 50% chance of either typing a letter right side up or upside down. Now just take that simple idea and let's assume now that it doesn't matter what it wrote, it could type out anything on a page. No punctuation, no spelling, words don't have to be right. It's just getting one page of all upright letters. How long, at a page a second, how long do you think it would take for a computer to type that page? Well, it's very easy to calculate it. If you figure uh, 5,000 letters on a page, it would be like randomly flipping 5,000 heads in a row. Well, at a second a page, the answer is it would take 10 billion years just to randomly type all upright letters on a page. But the complexity of the DNA molecule is so much more staggering than that. You would not only have to print one page of all upright letters, but it would also have to spell out perfect characteristics and it would have to be spelled perfectly and, pu and punctuated perfectly. And not only would you have to type one page, you would have to type 500,000 pages just to form one DNA molecule. Let me describe it another way. Imagine each amino acid could either be flipped heads or tails. To work, all amino acids in the chain must be the same. In other words, all of hundreds must be, quote, flipped heads for that one single molecule. Of course, expanding this into an entire creature, you were talking about many thousands of consecutive coins being flipped heads, something that is statistically absurd. Secondly, amino acids first form into short chains. If you imagine each amino acid component as a letter, the evolutionist would imagine a scenario that would require a computer randomly producing letters that become meaningful words. And don't forget, they still have to be all flipped heads first. Thirdly, the short chains of amino acids bond into longer chains. Picture words becoming sentences and they have to make sense. A sentence of words randomly thrown together would usually not make sense. Now let's take that simple first step. Amino acids have to have the correct orientation. Again, like flipping heads many times in a row. If you were to consider only the number of correct flips, disregarding the words, disregarding the sentences that also have to make sense. The DNA information within a human being would make up about 500,000 pages with 5,000 letters per page.
Now let me put this in perspective. If we were to imagine atoms randomly coming together to form DNA, just to get one single page of the correct orientation of amino acids would require 5,000 flips of heads in a row. Now, suppose evolution could flip a coin 5,000 times a second. That's a lot of times a second. It would still take 10 billion years just to get a single upright page of letters. But keep in mind, this is a simple example. It is a small part of the problem. We need 500,000 of these pages of upright letters or flips of heads. Now, that's a simpler way to understand the complexity, but getting into this in great detail, there are many books on this subject that you can get into great detail on this, but the bottom line is we couldn't form that first DNA molecule, let alone form a first living cell. Now, ob observation involves several types of things. We can observe things of the past, like fossils. We can observe things that are happening at the current time, uh, such as mutations of various creatures. And we can even speculate on things through observable experiments. Let's take fossils. Now Darwin himself was convinced that fossils would eventually produce concrete evidence of his theories of evolution. He thought that digging up bones would eventually reveal transitional species. Understand that in Darwin's day, very few fossils existed at all. But today, we have millions and millions and millions of fossils fossils provide some very strong evidence of creation. Scientists recently discovered that many life forms somehow appeared suddenly in a very short period of time. And it sounds just like the Genesis account. It's called the Cambrian Explosion. Microbiologists have strong evidence against the simplest evolutionary changes occurring over billions of years. Now let's take the area of mutations. With the electron microscope, we discovered that species could be defined with DNA. Because of that, there has to be a change in DNA for a species to evolve from one species to another. So, Evolutionists have come up with a theory of mutation. After all, we've all seen pictures of uh, deformed animals or Siamese twins. The theory was proposed that through a series of positive mutations caused a very fortunate evolutionary change. But mutational changes are almost always destructive. They do not advance species. Secondly, mutations are not inherited. Siamese twins don't run in families. Mutations are caused by external events and are entirely different than genetic tendencies. Let's just suppose that we could create the exact molecules and cell structure for life. And let's further suppose that we could put them all in the right place perfectly to form a human body. You know, we would have essentially the equivalent of a dead body. Take a dead body, presumably after something dies, we could then repair it with the right parts and bring it back to life. We can't. It's like the intuition example. Someone still needs to wind the watch.
Maybe you've seen some of the uh, wonderful, dramatic uh, photographs from, from the Hubble Space Telescope or seen uh, you know, the COBE satellite passing Jupiter or some of these wonderful uh, 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 photographs and things from the planet of Mars. So let's talk about cosmology because we're really in, a, in an era, uh, the Bible talks about a tremendous increase in information at the end of the age and we are certainly, if you were to look at a curve of the amount of information we have right now, you will find that it's, it's dramatically increased in, in a very, very short period of time and perhaps nowhere as much as the area of cosmology or the study of the heavens. Now, for a hundred years, great intellects have been trying to use cosmology or the study of the heavens to actually uh, prove that God doesn't exist. Well, uh, now we know that this has really backfired. Starting in about the 1940s and, and again, dramatically increasing, uh, especially in the 1990s, uh, science is confirming the Bible like never before. Not only does the proof of a creator exist, it actually matches exactly the account that's given in the Bible. First, let's consider some new facts. We know that the Hubble telescope, it was ironic in a way that when we had the first problems with the Hubble telescope, instead of looking at near things because it basically had what we would call blurry vision or out of focus camera, but when you get out to very long focal lengths, it makes little difference. So what happened was we did some of the experiments of the edges of the universe before we did some of the closer in experiments which required fixing the Hubble telescope. But what that did in combination with the uh, COBE space satellite uh, or Explorer, what it did was it helped us confirm, again, general relativity. It also gave us a view for the first time of the actual edges of the universe. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the world's greatest scientists have, have uh, when, when they, they heard this news, uh, uh, you know, we had T Ted Koppel talking about it on TV and Stephen Hawking and many, uh, Carlos Frank and many of the top scientists were saying, in effect, this is almost like looking at God as the way it was uh, positioned. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the world seemed to not get it in general. We didn't, uh, it didn't, even though at first it was front page news and some major news uh, papers across, across the world uh, on TV, the general public didn't respond the way I wish they did. Now why didn't they respond? Well, one, these are concepts are, that are difficult to understand, um, even for many scientists. If you're not a physicist, and, and physics is one of the most detailed and, and, and uh, uh, maybe difficult areas of science, it would be very difficult to understand the concept of general relativity, for example. Uh, for example, who can conceive of the beginning of time and space? It's difficult, I think, for all of us in some way. Number two, it's hard to accept. If we really know that there was a beginning and a creator of the universe, uh, many people don't want to believe that they might be accountable to something for eternity or something else, perhaps a god of the universe. So there's resistance not only from a, a difficult and an intellectual standpoint, there's also a resistance from an emotional standpoint. It's sometimes more convenient just not to believe. Science and the study of the planets has gone much further. We now know that there are billions of stars, billions of stars and even billions of galaxies. We also suspect that there are billions of planets. We don't know this. Uh, and of course you've read a lot recently or heard a lot recently of discovery of planets. A lot of that has been proven untrue. But uh, let's not argue that point. Let's assume maybe there are billions of planets. But do billions of planets mean that there's another Earth out there? The more you study Earth and the critical parameters necessary for life on Earth, the more you can easily become convinced that there is absolutely no chance or almost no chance of another Earth existing. Every single year in the past 10 years, we have learned many more criteria that are absolutely critical for life on Earth we find finely tuned details about planet Earth that absolutely could not have occurred by mere chance. Some of them are obvious. The distance of the Earth from the Sun, obviously very important in terms of determining the heat. 
The time of the rotation of the Earth is important for things like uh, gestation, for, uh, uh, again, for the amount of heat in certain parts of the planet. Some other factors are much less obvious. The ratio of oxygen to nitrogen is critical. The tilt of the planet Earth is critical. Things you never think about. The size of the moon is critical. The fact that we have one moon, not more than one moon, is critical. There are many, many little details that, again, would take a long time to go through. And most of these, in fact, we now know that the list extends to over 60 finely tuned criteria of planet Earth that are necessary for life. 60. And many of these, if you vary them by just a few percent, a single change in any one of these by a few percentage points would make it virtually impossible for life to exist on Earth. Again, if you run through the calculations, it's very easy to understand that the odds of another planet Earth are vir virtually, uh, virtually zero. Now, science is going to continue to expand in this area, and it's going to be an exciting one to get into. But you'll find there are so many little things that you'll never think about that are vital to our survival. Uh, things that you think of as being destructive, earthquakes, volcanoes. Uh, you think of these as being terribly destructive, but they play a very uh, key role in, in life on Earth. Thunderstorms, the discharge of lightning, all of these are finely tuned in the balance. The, the amount of land in the northern hemisphere versus, versus the amount of land in the southern hemisphere, the ratio of land to water, all of these play a vital part that we've learned through cosmology is a very important point to uh, allowing for life on Earth. And it's again just another uh, aspect of evidence of the miraculous and finely tuned design of a creator. You know, I frequently get asked by people, uh, what are the chances of life uh, on other planets? Now, we've talked about how highly improbable, virtually impossible there it is that we would even have another planet like Earth. But of course, uh, we, we get the media bringing us attention of this uh, Mars rock that came and supposedly had some evidence of life from Mars. Uh, I want to talk about that just for a second because I, I think it's important for people to understand. Uh, first of all, it would not be a surprise to astrophysicists to eventually find evidence of life on Mars or even several other planets in our solar system. But we're not talking about little green men here. We're talking about life forms that actually traveled from Earth to other planets. Let me explain. Since about 1960, scientists have realized that tiny microbes of life exist around our planet in the higher-most parts of our atmosphere. And these tiny little microbes, uh, extremely small, a micron or a tenth of a micron or less than that, very, very small in the upper areas of our atmosphere, are swept away by what's called a solar wind. A solar wind is basically, you may have heard the word photons, they are photons from the sun that are constantly bombarding our planet and they're, they're powerful enough and the gravity up there is weak enough because these are little tiny, tiny specks, uh, they're sweeping these specks of life away to other planets. So almost on a daily basis, we are actually transporting through the solar wind life from planet Earth to other planets. And secondly, we've done calculations that have confirmed that if we had a meteor strike the Earth, it would be large enough to create a 60-mile crater on Earth. And there have been a few of those in the past. Obviously, they, they don't happen on an annual basis by any means. It's something that's very, very rare. But the calculations show that if a meteor of that size struck the Earth, it would be powerful to launch boulders into outer space that would strike other planets. 
uh, we found that uh, you know you can calculate that a certain number would be pulled into the gravi gravity of Venus. Other rocks would would even reach Mercury and Mars and Jupiter and possibly even a f one or a few, very few to, to Saturn. And calculations have confirmed all of this. Of course, depending where the Earth was in its uh, travel around the solar system at that point in time. And obviously, if such rocks had embedded in them forms of life, whether it be in the form of fossils or, or even li live life of uh, microscopic type or whatever, uh, these, lives, uh, these rocks containing some evidence of life could reach other planets. And again, it would be from Earth. You know, physics is an amazing area of science that offers incredible support for creation. The first thing we need to do is put in perspective physics of a of hundred years ago or a few hundred years ago versus what we know today. Now when Galileo was playing with billiard balls and others with apples, what we were doing was basically defining laws of motion or physics within things that we could see and feel and touch and calculate, uh, which things that deal with the negative eye, uh, naked eye. Now we can get into areas that are a lot more complex than that. In fact, with Einstein, with quantum physics, with many new tools we have now, we're able to delve deeper not only into the atoms themselves, but also, of course, deeper into the heavens, into outer space. Now, Newtonian physics still applies uh, within the tangible world that we're used to dealing with. What Einstein did was basically define it in a much more uh, complete, uh, in a complete way. What he did was he basically provided us equations that can help us understand both the universe as a whole and also uh, atoms and the way they behave. And it definitely is very clearly in support of the Bible, much more, more clearly in support of the Bible than Newtonian physics. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of technical equations here, but I want to talk about one very important thing, and that, that is what used to be called the theory of general relativity. I say used to be called that because when Einstein first developed this theory, he, he was only confident we could only test it to a level of about a 90% degree of accuracy. Now we can test this theory to a level of 99.999, I think 26 uh, decimal places of precision, which means that it is essentially fact. Why is this important? What general relativity defines in the most basic sense is it basically says that there was a beginning of time and a beginning of space. Again, this, this is a hard concept for most human beings to conceive of, a beginning of time, beginning of space. It's not difficult for the astrophysicist, it's not difficult for the mathematician, but it's difficult for most of us. But yet it's been verified by many experiments and by many different equations. In fact, Einstein himself tried to find a way around his own theory by including a constant into his equation. And the reason he tried that was he was trying to exclude God because he realized himself that if in fact his equations were accurate, what it meant, it implied that there was a beginning of time, a beginning of space, and that implied, of course, a beginner or a creator. But by the time Einstein died, he fully acknowledged that his attempt to exclude uh, God from the equation was one of the biggest mistakes of his professional career. He eventually accepted the notion that there had to be some kind of creator. That doesn't mean Einstein had a personal relationship with God, but at least he acknowledged that a God must have existed. Let me talk about another area of physics, the uh, area of thermodynamics. 
Uh, there are uh, two basic laws that most people, or at least some people, are familiar with. The first law of thermodynamics, which basically says that no matter or energy can be created, it just can be converted from one to the other. And the other one, the second law of thermodynamics, is the law of, of entropy, which basically, uh, this, this offers very strong support for creation. Remember the watch example? How inconceivable it is that intricate gears and the mechanism of a watch could tumble and ooze and not wear out and somehow become more and more precise? Well, the second law of thermodynamics actually deals with that type of a problem. Uh, things have a tendency to wear down. Things become more disorganized, like someone's desk, not more complex. It takes purposeful energy to organize your desk or to polish gears on a watch. Uh, to the precision that it takes to work at all. Evolution denies this basic law because what it does is it s assumes random luck somehow makes things better and better and more organized. Yet there's no evidence of that happening in our, in our universe without some purposeful design or purposeful input of energy. In fact, all laws of physics are consistent with the biblical account. You'll find many places in the Bible where it refers to the beginning of time. Uh, so the Bible offers a lot of evidence now that we didn't understand at the time, but now with the, the benefit of some of the equations of Einstein, plus all of the corroboration that we've had from other experiments, we've come to realize that these biblical words were right all along. Now, if we're going to discuss creation, we need to think about how do miracles happen and how can we understand uh, this creation miracle. The word miracle is, in a way, it's an oxymoron. It implies something happened that we could perceive as being impossible, at least from our perspective. Our perspective changes as we look deeper into molecules and further into outer space. But the thing we can't do on this earth is look beyond our constraints of time or the three dimensions of space, height, width, and depth. Many of the scientific field have actually looked into different areas of dimensionality and in quantum physics have actually even defined areas of dimensions that are beyond those that we know. But for most of us, it's very difficult to conceive of this. How can we as humans conceive of no time? Uh, how can we see, conceive of uh, no, no space? It seems like there had to be a beginning of time, but it also seems there couldn't have been a beginning of time. And space seems to be endless, although it almost seems like there has to be an ending. Science has defined now and determined that time and space both had a beginning, exactly as it stated in Genesis 1.1. We'll talk more about that later. But first, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of dimensionality. And one way to understand dimensions beyond the ones we know are to consider dimensions beneath the ones we know. In other words, it's a lot easier for us to look at three dimensions and try to imagine a world in two dimensions and understand how miracles can happen in that world. Let me introduce you to what I call flatland. Flatland will be, for purposes of this example, will be this tabletop. It's flat. It's two-dimensional. Now, imagine that I've created this world flat man, flatland, and I've created uh, many types of creatures. And I want to introduce you to uh, uh, here a couple I've cut out. Uh, miss, this is Mr. Flat, and here's another creature that uh, I created, and we'll call it Mrs. Flat. And I, I can place these people in flatland, okay, and I can also create, I could cut out little fish, I could cut out birds, I could cut out all kinds of creatures and place them in this imaginary land called flatland. Now, how would Mr. and Mrs. Flat view each other? Well, to each other, they would really just look as, as a line, a single line. They wouldn't be able to have nearly the view that I have looking down on them. 
And if they want to learn more about each other, they kind of need to walk around each other and they can get some kind of a concept of what they really are, but they can't really see the total picture the way I can. So, what would be a flatland miracle? Suppose I see, say, a group of flatlanders was growing very, very hungry. If I wanted to, I could cut out a bunch of little fish, and I could just suddenly plop down a lot of little fish in flatland. They would miraculously appear. They would have no idea how I'm doing it, but I know because I exist in three dimensions. In two dimensions, coming one down one dimension, it would seem to be a miracle. Now, let's suppose I made a, another space that existed in three dimensions. We'll call these the top of this set of books three-dimensional heaven. Now, these people in Flatland can't see this area called heaven. Uh, but as the creator of Flatland, I can do several things. Number one, if I want to insert myself in Flatland, it's pretty easy. I just stick my finger down and people will see what? they'll see a line. Or if I want to stick three fingers down, what will they see? They'll see three lines. So what do you know? Mr. Flat over here sees one line, miss, and he says, I understand God. He's a line. This, uh, Mrs. Flat over here will see three and say, no, you're wrong. I see God, and God's three lines. But yet they have no concept of what I am, which is, of course, a lot more than just a line or three lines. But if I wanted to create a miracle and transport one of these flatland people into my imaginary heaven, all I need to do is lift them up and place them in this new dimension. Yet someone down here has no concept whatsoever of what this other dimension is. Now, obviously this whole ob object or this example of flatland is an extremely elementary example and it doesn't address a lot of issues, but what it does do is help us realize that we are limited by uh, dimensions of space and time. And to consider miracles, one should consider the very distinct possibility that science seems to support these days that there are dimensions far beyond the ones that we live in. Let's talk about something that people sometimes fail to consider, and that is um, the source of the Bible's account of creation uh, as itself, because it's the Bible. Now, in order to talk about this, we need to establish uh, why should we believe the Bible in the first place. Did you know that the Bible contains 667 historical prophecies that have virtually all been confirmed to have happened? 667. Now, some of these prophecies were long-term prophecies, some were short-term prophecies, but, and, but many were extremely specific. For example, proph prophecies included the naming of Cyrus, the king of Persia, hundreds of years before he was even born, as the king that would eventually cause the temple in Jerusalem to be rebuilt hundreds of years before the temple was even destroyed. That's pretty incredible, naming the person, naming the events, and naming what was going to happen. Precise prophecies actually define the exact day that Jesus would enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. This day was defined hundreds of years before Christ. The list of prophecies in the Bible is enormous and absolutely mind-boggling. I could spend hours just talking about uh, precise prophecies of times, of places, of events, of people. Uh, it really clearly reveals the inspiration of the Bible from God.
the Bible also contains many scientific insights, insights that were entirely correct thousands of years before science knew the facts. These insights are in areas of medicine, engineering, we've already named a, a few, the beginning of time, uh, things that people just totally didn't understand until modern science. In fact, if you were, were, if you were to look at a list of some 40 or 50 uh, scientific insights in the Bible, you would find that virtually none of them were discovered until at least a, a thousand to two thousand years later by science. Yet every single reference to science in the Bible is 100 percent accurate. And of course the Bible is not a textbook on science, but because it's inspired by God, one would expect it to be accurate. An important one of these scientific insights is creation itself. Now with all the other facts and prophecies in the Bible being accurate, it would seem we should carefully consider the creation account even if it differed from what science thought, just because of all these other facts that have been shown to be true. But the truth of the matter is, the account of creation in the Bible totally agrees with the sequence of events of creation according to science today. Now, if some of you want to take a Bible out and get, turn to Genesis 1, uh, I'd like to review some of the important insights. Someone with a scientific mind will immediately be struck by two very important items. First, of course, we have the statement of initial conditions. And if you look in your Bible, you will find that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, was without form and void. Uh, this is a, an initial conditions uh, state of conditions that a scientist will relate to. When you do an experiment, you always want to start with a set of initial conditions. Secondly, the Bible gives you a frame of reference. You will find, again in the first chapter of Genesis, God's Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters, or some Bibles will say of the deep. But what that's telling you is the frame of reference from which to read Genesis is not some God out in the cosmos someplace, but it's a, it's a God whose spirit is right at the surface of the waters. So this reference point will make all of the rest of the events of creation make sense, especially to a scientist. And third, I want to reemphasize that the, Bi the purpose of the Bible is not a science textbook. It was not to give us all the intimate details of creation. What it was, was the Bible is to deal with events that are significant to man. It also shows how God is involved with man, that he had a personal, a, a purposeful methodology in how he put things together. But it, the purpose of the Bible, of course, was not to give us a science textbook. You could have a textbook much bigger than the, the entire Bible doing nothing but talking about the events of creation. God's purpose was simple. How does creation affect man? and who was the master of creation. Just for a basis for understanding, I'd like to talk just a second about the basis for the young earth, old earth, Christian conflict. The conflict is really rooted in the Hebrew words for day and the Hebrew words for morning and evening as translated in Genesis. See, Biblical Hebrew really had only about 3,000 commonly used words, which of course is far, far fewer than the number of words we commonly use in the English language today. The Hebrew word for day is the word yom, as, as in yom kippur. And what that meant usually was a literal 24-hour day and hence it was translated as such in our modern Bibles. Yet it could also have meant a defined period of time or an era, much like we might say in the day of the nights of old or something like that. Now at the time of Moses, there was no suitable word to mean defined period of time other than yom. So while young earth supporters will argue yom meant a literal 24-hour day, Old Earth would argue that it was in fact a long defined period of time. There was really no other word that they could use. 
But don't let this young earth, old earth debate pull you off the track of the central issue, which is creation versus evolution. The God of the universe could have easily worked either within the laws of physics, which would be reflected in the scientific record, or a God could have transcended the laws of physics. Well, if we're going to take a look at the Bible as a source of authority for creation, which of course I, I believe we should, especially after reviewing the, uh, the points about the, the incredible uh, evidence of the accuracy of the Bible, uh, what we need to do is take a look at the steps of creation in the Bible. And essentially there are ten steps of creation listed in the Bible that actually agree precisely with science as we know it today. Let's talk about step one. Step one is pretty basic. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. The darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The heavenly bodies here were being created and the initial conditions were that the, the earth was, was formless and void of creatures and that sort of thing. And of course, this precisely agrees with what science feels was the original condition of the earth. Now, did God do this through some big bang or some other process? It really doesn't matter. It could have, could have been through a big bang or he could have just created it. That is not the issue. Let's move to step two. Step two is in Genesis 1-3. And it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. This would seem to be a contradiction or a problem for a scientist, because he, a scientist might say, well, wait a minute, if the heavens and the earth were created on the first day, are we saying here that all these stars and everything didn't have any, any light? Well, you have to consider again the frame of reference. God's Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then it starts to make per a perfect sense to a scientist because most scientists would agree that the initial conditions the of, of the earth, the earth was, was covered by very dense, dark gases that would not have allowed light to penetrate to the surface of the waters. So th through some process that's not explained in the Bible, uh, I think scientists might even differ on exactly how it happened, but through some process, the earth's very dense, dark atmosphere was made to be translucent, so at least enough light could, could come to the surface of the earth to allow for such important things as photosynthesis and that sort of thing. Step three uh, is in Genesis 1-6. Let's take a quick look at that now. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. What does that mean? to separate water from water. What this essentially is referring to is the development of the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle. Uh, with light now reaching the surface of the deep, it allows for water to evaporate and create the clouds, which is the separation of the water above and the water below. This, of course, to a scientist, this is extremely important. This hydrological cycle or water cycle is a vital part of the ability to support the life that was to come next. Okay, step four is Genesis 1-9. Let's just read it real briefly. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered water he called seas. God saw that it was good. Well, to a scientist that studies the formation of the earth, they would to be in total agreement. What scientists will say is that at this point in the earth's history, there was a tremendous amount of seismic, uh, earthquake type of activity, volcanic activity, which basically allowed the land to rise above the waters and separated the, uh, the waters from the, uh, from the land. 
And the, and the important thing is that land was required for man. It might be interesting to note that scientists have actually calculated that the ratio of land to water on the earth is the precise ratio that would allow for the maximum amount of life forms on a planet like Earth. So uh, even down, down to details, and I could go through a number of other ones, it's amazing to me the precision of each of these steps and how it meets the needs of what God's intention was. Step five. You'll find step five in uh, Genesis 1.11. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kinds. And it was so. The creation of vegetation during this third day uh, or third period could only occur, of course, with light reaching the surface of the earth and with plenty of carbon dioxide on the earth, which scientists again know was a very major component of the Earth's early atmosphere. Plants, of course, have to breathe carbon dioxide in order uh, to survive. By the way, I want to point out that if, if you read through the Bible and you, you say, ha, ah, there's a step missing. We don't have the dinosaurs uh, mentioned in Genesis, or we don't have this, or we don't have that. Keep in mind, God's purpose in telling us the story of creation isn't to give us a science textbook. You could write a whole book on any one of these areas. But he's, his purpose was to show that creation was purposeful, that he did it, and to describe the steps and how they would relate to man. So most of the, the uh, animals and vegetation and things that you find listed in Genesis are, are animals, vegetation, things that are important to man for one reason or another. Let's move on to step six. Step six you can find in Genesis 1.14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark the seasons and the days and the years and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. Think about it for a second from a scientific point of view. We've talked about how we have, uh, basically, basically we have light coming through this translucent atmosphere. We have plants now that are taking in carbon dioxide. What do they produce? They produce oxygen. Oxygen, of course, is a vital element necessary for any of the creatures that are going to be breathing oxygen, like man. Interestingly, oxygen also is one of the factors of helping create a transparent atmosphere like we have today. So that suddenly we're able to see through the atmosphere and we're able to see the stars in the heavens and the, the great lights uh, of, the, of the sun and the moon, which previously in a translucent atmosphere would be barely visible. And of course, the star is probably not visible at all. So essentially, uh, this step, step six, agrees with what science would agree happened once you consider God's spirit hovering over the surface of the deep. Modern translations seem to imply that the sun and the moon and the stars were created that day. However, this is where you need to go back to the original Hebrew in the Bible because as we said earlier in this uh, series, uh, sometimes Hebrew words had to be used because there weren't other words that could be used and sometimes there is a misunderstanding in modern translation. If you examine the original Hebrew in the Bible, you'll find that it does, does not use the word bara. Bara in Hebrew means to create out of nothing. Now in Genesis 1.1, the creation of the heavens and the earth, bara is used. And bara is used in the creation of man and other events of creation. However, on day four, uh, the word bara is not used. On day four, the original Hebrew words could have meant made as in the past tense or could have meant made to appear. Obviously, if in God's process oxygen 
was making the atmosphere more transparent than the sun, moon, and stars would have been made to appear on the surface of the earth, which is where God's Spirit was hovering. And of course, this was what allowed the value that's discussed in this chapter to man. The value here is to, to mark the seasons and day and night and that sort of thing. So it's important to understand that even though we have modern translations that might be a little bit misleading, that to really understand exactly what the Bible is telling us, we need to be open to, to the original Hebrew words that were used. Step seven is in Genesis 1.20. Let me just read it briefly. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to his kind. And God saw that it was good. What we're talking about here is again, whether it's 24 hour day or a long period of time, a scientist would, would believe and old earth would believe, is the creation of small sea animals and the birds uh, and not necessarily in that order, it's just basically in that period of time, that's when these are created. Now, all of the, the animals discussed in the Bible are those that were important to man. Let's move on to step eight, Genesis 1.24. Let me uh, briefly read that. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. It also is interesting to me that the Bible is very clear that these animals and creatures are creating according to their kind. What that, does, that says is it's not saying they evolved from one to another. They basically were created in a class in and of themselves, which of course now with DNA research, we know basically what these kinds are, how we can define these kinds through DNA and through their ability to reproduce. Let's move to step nine. Step 9 is in Genesis 1.26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So here we have the Bible finally talking about the creation of man. Uh, again, I want to emphasize the word bara is used here, created out of nothing. In other words, there was no pre-existing ape that he turned into a man. He created man out of nothing. An important point to realize is that man is defined in the Bible as having a spiritual relationship with God. Only man was created to worship God, which you find in many places within the Bible. Step 10, that actually occurs in uh, Genesis 2.2. 2. Let me read that briefly. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing, and so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. At the time of Moses, there was no culture on earth that had any idea of how planets developed or the world or creatures on the earth no one had this information that we know today. But somehow, Moses happened to know these steps. That's, that's a miracle in and of itself that even so, someone would know the steps, which would imply that it was divinely inspired. But for one minute, let's assume that all of today's science existed back then, except that Moses just had to guess the order of the 10 events of creation. In other words, let's say that science knew all this stuff and, and Moses was given the challenge, okay Moses, guess from one to 10 how creation happened. Well, just for Moses to properly guess the correct order of the 10 events described, assuming he knew them, 
would be equivalent to winning a state lottery. And of course that assumes that he knew the events to begin with. If we randomly evolved from other life forms, in a sense, we are really no different than animals. It would imply that there is no God that purposely created us. And if we have no God and no purpose, it leads to the idea of no absolute authority. How do we define right and wrong? How do we define good and bad? Have you ever heard the phrase, I have to do what's right for me, or a phrase, if it feels good, do it. But what was right for Hitler was not right for the world. Many things that, quote, feel good can lead to problems. Things like sexual diseases or drug problems or, or family breakups. Before evolution, the Bible was generally regarded as the ultimate authority and the standard. It was often not followed, of course, but at least it required a willful rejection of an accepted authority. Now, if evolution is true, there is no God involved with people, and there is no God to help us with our daily problems, and there is no hope for life after death. But if creation, especially the biblical account of creation, is true, then God is an available source of strength for today, and some will spend an eternity in a paradise called heaven, yet some will spend an eternity in a horror called hell. Therefore, the consequences of the truth of this issue are enormous. It would be utterly foolish not to take time to investigate the evidence. As we've seen, there is so much overwhelming evidence supporting creation. It makes one ask, well, why is there this great debate of creation versus evolution? Well, there are th really three reasons. The first is ignorance. If you don't know the facts, if you don't know this new information, you're going to make an informed decision on which is right. And frankly, most of the world even most of the scientific world today is just unaware of the facts. Keep in mind, we're talking about many things that have happened over the last few years. And even scientists that are very knowledgeable in one area often are not knowledgeable in other areas that have a very important bearing on this system or this idea of origins. The second is the, the continual uh, propensity of people to have old-fashioned thinking. As we saw in our discussion of history, there were several key debates that Christians lost, not because they, the truth was not on their side. They lost the debates because science wasn't smart enough to know the answers at that point in time. So they lost debates based on faulty assumptions. A lot of this old historical thinking still exists in the minds of many people today. The third reason people reject creation is perhaps the saddest of all, and that's apathy. Frankly, some people insist on rejecting the idea of a supernatural God at all costs. Now, we can correct ignorance with knowledge. We can correct misconception of history with facts. But it's difficult to change the thinking that really comes from someone's heart, someone who's re determined to reject the possibility of a God, no matter how strong the evidence is. Now, in summary, we've looked at a lot of things in this series. We've looked at virtually all areas of science. We have found every single one, bar none, supports creation. We've examined facts that have come forth to us in, in just the last few years. The challenge to us now is to get these facts out into the world so that the common person knows these facts. And that's the purpose of this series. We hope that what we have presented you through these new findings and through uh, this whole series of information 
you can use to teach your own family, to become knowledgeable yourself, to tell your friends. There is overwhelming evidence for creation, the creation exactly as laid out in the Bible. Now it's up to us to help tell the rest of the world.